Today, the subject of my presentation will be mapping, monitoring, and modeling of rock slides. So we, what we intend for a rock slide? So we mean usually uh, the sliding of a rock mass on a planar surface, a curvilinear surface, or a compound surface. So this is just a, an initial difference between uh, um, a single class of landslide phenomena that we can consider quite interesting, especially because changing the size uh, and uh, the type of surface, we will have a different behavior of the rock mass. In particular, we will observe different internal deformation uh, within uh, the landslide, and we could observe quite different type uh, of uh, evolution of the same phenomenon. If we want to establish a comprehensive approach for the study of rock slides, uh, first of all, we, we need to, to be able to map and uh, recognize or identify rock slide on a local and a regional scale. Um, the next step will be the geological investigation and characterization of the landslide and uh, of the uh, involved material, and uh, possibly the establishing of a, a low resolution monitoring network just to understand which kind of uh, level of activity we have in this kind of uh, phenomenon. Uh, in this way, we will be able to um, build up a first set uh, of scenarios and possibly to establish uh, some uh, basic references for the emergency plans. The third step uh, could be um, the performing or uh, the carrying out of uh, direct and indirect uh, investigation, um, the setting up of uh, borrowed instrumentation, and the starting of monitoring uh, in depth. Uh, at this stage, we could also uh, construct, build up a, a complete rock mass characterization and reach a, a complete definition of the slide geometry and the possible scenarios. Uh, the next three step uh, will be the more uh, uh, deeper one involving uh, the preliminary modeling, the definitive uh, um, production of uh, civil emergency plans, uh, the establishing of a complete monitoring network uh, uh, with a high redundancy, uh, so to be able to um, have an early warning system working uh, at the site, and the early warning system should uh, be working under uh, some specific threshold or um, indicators of the state of activity and the changes of activities. And finally, we could start going through the advanced modeling of the phenomenon. So the contents of this presentation will be large rock slide mainly, and um, we will look at uh, the general uh, regional incidence of this phenomenon at the origin scale. We will try to find a relationship between uh, um, the type of phenomenon, the displacement and the rock mass quality and uh, characteristics. And, uh, and then we will pass through a series of uh, case studies looking at the monitoring data and uh, the possibility to uh, have a well-performing early warning system. Uh, this doesn't want to be a comprehensive lecture on uh, rock slides, and um, there's been plenty of literature written on, uh, on the subject, and uh, there are some very good books uh, right uh, behind me. And uh, so it's mainly based on, uh, on my personal experience and the experience of the group of people that work with me in uh, the last uh, 10 years, more or less, on this subject. So if we start looking at uh, the alpine uh, origin, we can uh, map different phenomena. In this case, uh, uh, in this picture, you see um, both very deep uh, sliding phenomena, in particular deep-seated uh, slope gravitational deformation, and uh, large landslide and uh, rock avalanches. Um, working at this scale, at a relatively fine uh, scale, uh, even for the, a so large area, we identified something like uh, 1,000 deep-seated slope deformation, 2,000 large landslides, and about uh, 150 rock avalanches uh, in the entire area. What is interesting is that once you have this data set, you can try to work out uh, some relationship between uh, uh, morphometrical parameters and landslide distribution. So uh, in, in the plot on the left, you have simply the uh, slope distribution for cells within and uh, outside uh, um, deep-seated deformations. So what you see is that uh, the distribution is changing uh, quite clearly and uh, the, the mean value and the model value are moving uh, with uh, getting inside the landslide toward slower, lower 
uh, slow pi angles. So this is interesting because uh, in, in this way we are transferring mass uh, and um, and so we are eroding the material from the slope and bringing material in the valley. And this can be done usually because we have a change in uh, the rock mass properties. Uh, on the right hand side, you have a picture showing, uh, um, on the basis of a PS sensor uh, data, a reclassification of the of deep seated landslide on the basis of the state of activity. Okay, the first case is. Uh, um, a case where we want to establish a relationship between uh, um, rock mass characteristics within and outside a rock slide and the cumulative displacement uh, uh, recorded within the mass. So the case study is in the Artesian platform, uh, so in the uh, Trento province in Italy, and um, it's uh, in a study uh, focused on a quarry slope, 250 meters high, in uh, rhyolitic uh, Indian brides. Uh, in 2003, um, as you can see in the lower uh, uh, left corner, the, the, the picture that you see is uh, an image showing the um, displacement map in the line of sight as obtained from a time-lapse uh, ground-based INSAR campaign. And uh, the entire slope starts moving and um, the query activity uh, was uh, suspended for a certain interval of time just to understand what was going on at the scale of the entire slope. And the uh, time-lapse uh, campaign continued through um, the years up to 2011. So the, the total mass that was moving was about uh, half a million cubic meter of uh, um, porphyry rocks. So the, the next step uh, was uh, uh, trying to have a quite tight, uh, dense uh, um, characterization of the rock mass in the area. And in the left uh, uh, picture, you see um, a series of dots that are under the 90 location where uh, a GSI classification has been uh, completed on uh, the quarry slopes. And uh, you see also uh, on um, much lighter colors uh, the uh, map of the displacement recorded uh, during the um, in this case, uh, 2011 period. Uh, on the right, you see the statistical analysis of the displacement uh, as uh, um, computed for areas with different uh, uh, geological strength index. So we subdivided the, the, the quarry size slope in areas with different rock mass properties. And for each uh, rock mass property, we have uh, analyzed the statistical uh, distribution of the displacement. And you see that the cumulative displacement effectively is uh, distributed as according more or less an exponential relationship uh, with uh, uh, the rock mass quality. Um, one more step was um, the topographical characterization, the morphometrical characterization of the slopes and uh, to study both the changes in time and uh, to characterize the rock masses. So the idea here was that uh, if you have um, an uh, undisturbed rock mass and uh, what you should see uh, is uh, um, r a relatively low dispersion in orientation of the topography or the morphometry. If the rock mass is quite disturbed, so, uh, and in this case, if you move from outside to inside the rock slide, the material will start being more and more damaged and disturbed. And so you will have a, a much higher di uh, dispersion of uh, orientation data. And uh, this is what you observe in uh, the lower right uh, images over here. So you, if you look outside of the rock slide, where the uh, GSI index is relatively high, you have a very small dispersion of your um, orientation. And if you go through the more damaged area, up to the more damaged area, you see an increase, a progressive increase in orientation, in dispersion of the orientation. So at this point, what we have found is that uh, there is a relationship between uh, uh, morphometry and uh, um, total displacements or the um, properties of the rock mass. So in, the, in these plots, uh, you see, um, we, we can just look at the upper one that maybe is easier to understand. Fisher K is the, uh, a parameter that just uh, um, describes the dispersion of the 
orientation in space, and uh, the GSI degradation factor. That is simply the relationship between the local GSI measured at a specific point uh, along the slopes and a GSI reference. That in this case, GSI reference means simply the, the GSI for the same rock mass, uh, but in a completely undisturbed, or in the best condition on site. And what you see again, that you can have a very tight distribution when you have a very low degree of uh, degradation and you have a very sparse distribution indicated by a low Fisher value uh, when uh, the GSI goes down, uh, the, the, the degradation GSI go down. Okay, so in this case we have, um, we can identify a, um, a path in the GSI distribution moving from the undamaged to the uh, residual condition, so moving from outside the rock slide down to the uh, real rock slide core, where uh, maximum displacement, maximum disturbance has been observed. What is also interesting is that, uh, for example, with the TLS survey, you, you can run multiple TLS survey in a time-lapse modality, and in this way you will be able to see how, at which point your rock mass uh, is stressed and how much we are getting close to residual condition. And so to a, a possible different type of behavior of your mass. Okay, the next step would be, um, so we, we, had a, we have a geological characterization, a geomechanical characterization, a restarting geomechanical characterization. What we want to do now is just to install monitoring uh, um, equipment and to start collecting data, both at the surface and uh, um, at depth. Uh, the idea is to use monitoring both to understand uh, the rock slide and at the same time to uh, start using the monitoring as an early warning system or as a tool to provide uh, um, possible warnings to the population or to the people involved in the uh, managing of the sites. So I, I will go through uh, is three main um, case studies. The first one is the Ruinon rock slides. Uh, two of these case studies really are, are actually two of the most active uh, landslides or rock slides in, in the Alps, and the Italian Alps, I would say. And the Ruinon rock slide is uh, sited in uh, Valtellina, and um, especially in the Val Furva, very close to the city of Bormio. It involves uh, 15 to 20 cu million of cubic meters of uh, phyllites and uh, paragonites, and is partially covered by debris. It's a compound slide, uh, so the average depth that has been estimated is between 30 and 70 meters, according to the position uh, within the landslide mass. It occurs at the toe of a large uh, deep-seated uh, gravitational slope deformation, and very close uh, also to um, prehistoric uh, uh, large rock slides, and uh, it has a suspended toe. So that it is quite interesting because it could be a, a geometrical uh, control on the possible evolution of the landslide. Uh, through the years, starting uh, uh, since uh, 1998 to 2004, um, uh, the local uh, regional offices started to uh, monitor the slope with different kind of instrumentation, mainly with, uh, I would say, with uh, um, data uh, with the instrumentation to monitor uh, uh, surficial displacements. And uh, uh, since 1992, we have also a time series of uh, data for displacement from uh, uh, PSD INSER. And uh, especially in the upper part, you see that where we don't have a vegetation, we have displacement up to 40 millimeters per year. And in the lower part, we have much less points. And especially if you go through the ruin on lens, like you don't have any points because the displacement are uh, really too high. Okay, since nine, uh, 2006, um, a ground-based SAR is working uh, on a continuous regime uh, in the area and uh, at an average distance of uh, about 800 meters from uh, the slope. And uh, it's collecting data since uh, 2006 in a continuous way. So up to now we have something like 2,000, and I would say 2,900 days, more than 2,500, if we update that to the current date. And um, we work in especially on a specific uh, time interval that was between 2006 and 2011, working on uh, about 5,500 maps uh, or interferometric maps. And uh, 
we have some ground truthing and most of that is based on a GPS station, um, topographic measurements by um, a total station and some extensometer, Y extensometer data. Okay, through this uh, uh, set of data, we built, uh, for example, we extracted here some uh, monthly uh, displacement map, both in terms of cumulative displacement in the upper left corner and uh, incremental uh, displacement. So you see here the incremental displacement, how much displacement occurs every month, and here is simply the cumulative. So what is interesting in this case is that uh, having a special distributed um, uh, field of displacement, we are able to um, define areas that respond in a different way through the year or um, the seasonal regime of the landslide. Uh, we couple this with some geomorphological mapping starting from the 1960 up to 2013. Um, we are lucky that we have a, almost uh, a very good co coverage of the entire area by aerial photos. And uh, we have subdivided the main rock slide in 13 areas and then back uh, in uh, seven main uh, domains. So these seven main domains uh, were uh, a way to reduce the total number of areas in areas that can be monitored and for which we can provide uh, some um, early warnings for uh, uh, possible uh, scenarios of the evolution of the rock slide. So we have uh, areas with, uh, which are characterized by a very highly disrupted uh, rock mass, the main uh, rock scarp uh, in the upper part, uh, the rock slide head and a lower scarp still in rock, and uh, uh, the lower part of the slope that is mainly covered by um, debris. There are two more areas, the, the, the areas that we call G, and there are stable areas that we pick up, we choose them on the two sides of the, of the main rock slide as reference points, uh, just to understand uh, if something more critical was occurring, or in any case, to get uh, a reference for all the other displacement fields that we computed. Uh, from this uh, set of maps, uh, we generated a virtual network, so we extracted uh, about uh, 200 uh, uh, virtual sensors from uh, uh, the different maps, so we were able to construct time histories. And uh, um, within uh, these 205 virtual sensors, we had uh, 131 for which was possible to reconstruct a complete time series, so since 2006 to uh, 2011 for these analyses. And, uh, and so we were able to extract uh, all the time history for the most important areas within the slope. So what uh, it can be done now, or what we have done, was to uh, find a possible relationship between the displacement, the displacement rate, the cumulative displacement, and uh, some of the main triggering factors. In particular here, uh, we are talking about rainfalls and uh, uh, late snow melting uh, amounts. So we have defined uh, rainfall events, uh, usually just consider events uh, that are separated by other rainfall events uh, by a, a, a fixed number of days, fairly days in this case, or that uh, they at least uh, were not anticipated by a certain antecedent rain. And uh, we computed at this point the displacement rates uh, with a moving window, averaging the data over five days. And uh, here uh, I just represented here in these uh, figures, um, four plots uh, where we have uh, four different sectors of the rock slide represented in terms of displacement rate uh, with time just after a major uh, rainfall event. So the histogram, the bar is showing the amount of rainfall and uh, the curves are showing the displacement, the displacement rate. So what is interesting is that uh, if you go in uh, more uh, um, detritic areas like the two green areas over here for a more for a disrupted rock and uh, coarse debris uh, or for finer debris over here you see that uh, we have a, a rapid increase uh, in the displacement rate and a very low decrease uh, in time for uh, the upper one and instead for the fine debris material we have a rapid increase and then a very smooth and regular decrease in, uh, in speed. If we move on the rocky scarp, on the upper rocky scarp, uh, we are here. So we have simply a sort of pulsating, very small pulsating um, uh, changes in displacement rate. And if we go instead on the fixed uh, areas on the two sides, we see that we are mainly in 
in a very narrow, that is, uh, we, we are talking about 0 0.1 millimeter every six hours. So we are really in the, within the error interval uh, of, the, of the instrumentation. The other thing that you have to look at is that uh, the, the displacement rate is changing really in the maximum value. So we are going from 0 0.3 millimeter every six uh, hours up to six millimeter per six hours. Uh, we can do one more step. Uh, we can look at uh, um, no normalize displacement with respect to time. So here we are talking about 250 days. So and uh, this period of the year is the um, uh, melting season. So when most of the snow is uh, uh, melting. And what we observe is that the different areas are, res uh, are responding in a completely different way. For example, just look at B and G that are um, the upper scarp or the fixed areas. And you see that uh, after the, during the snow melting, you have a rapid increase, almost a fragile behavior. And then when after the displacement, after the major period of displacement, the system really stops, so you go flat. Um, if you take the other areas like A, C, and D, you see that you still have the step, but you have a sort of uh, viscous behavior on a long time. So the displacement is continuous through time in, in this area. And if you go finally in a E and a half, that are this region that below the lower scarf, you see that the behavior is completely different. So you have a sort of um, continuous displacement, very smooth, so no regular uh, acceleration in time. Um, we have also the complete set, for clearly, of uh, rainfall records and displacement records. And uh, what can be done is something similar to what we have done before, but with the ROCMAS uh, uh, properties. Uh, here we are doing that uh, with uh, the uh, rainfalls uh, and uh, the displacement rates. So we took one uh, specific area and we sampled all the uh, pixels within the area. So, and we reconstructed a statistical distribution for the displacement rate within a specific area for a specific time interval and a certain amount of precipitation. So what we had is a statistical representation of the um, distribution of the values and we can fit a line through the mean values of this uh, single uh, box and whisker plot. So what we obtain is a series of curves that uh, uh, show for each area and for each uh, um, duration of the uh, rainfall period, what is the response of our system. Uh, so the, the final result is represented in this figure. So we have a displacement rate with respect to cumulative rain for a different uh, duration of the event. And what we see is that uh, there are some fixed uh, uh, threshold value for uh, the cumulated, uh, cumulated rain that are required for the landslide to start moving and to start moving at a specific uh, displacement rate value. And for some of the, uh, and you see clearly that uh, um, using, the, we have the same vertical scale, so you see that for some region, when you go close to a rocky outcrop, the, the, the sensitivity is much, much smaller. The final step that we can look at is a classical um, example of an analysis uh, of intensity duration analysis. So we have intensity of rainfall on the uh, y-axis and uh, duration of the rainfall events on the x-axis. Uh, in a log-log scale. So um, here the events are represented in terms of displacement rates in terms of uh, uh, millimeters per hour. So you see that um, if you look at data within a debris, you, have, uh, um, you can recognize a pattern or a different threshold for different displacement rates. So the increase in the displacement rates, you will move from the green line to the brown line over here. Instead, if you go on a rocky outcrop, this is not possible. So you don't see any uh, real relationship. So that there's a sort of um, quite dispersed uh, population. So that, that could be used in two ways. So one is just to understand which kind of rainfalls are uh, mm, so powerful to activate the system. Or uh, you can use uh, in a backward way this um, data set just to recognize uh, automatically area with the rocky behavior from area with the more detritic behavior. Uh, 
Okay, the next example is uh, the Lasax rock slide. I will skip this uh, picture and we can go directly to this one. Lasax uh, is um, located in just uh, very close uh, to Courmayeur and uh, the, the rock slide area is uh, within, is occurring within a large dissipated slope deformation. And in particular, what this is quite interesting to, uh, to remind is that uh, uh, this rock slide is on the extreme uh, left-hand side of this uh, um, deep-seated slope deformation. Uh, is quite an interesting rock slide, mainly because it is quite active and because uh, we have so many elements at risk of high value that uh, makes of this landslide a, a very peculiar case that we can uh, study. Okay, from a geological point of view, the rocks that are involved uh, in, the, in the landslide are mainly metasedimentary rocks, so we have limestone, uh, marly limestone, black schist, calc schist, and uh, with a high cystosity, very well developed cystosity, and uh, the cystosity is between medium to high angle values, so it's, it can be almost uh, vertical or sub-vertical at many places. Since uh, 1991, 1999, uh, uh, there were clear signs or recorded signs of activity uh, with opening of fractures, uh, uh, pulled roots, uh, and, but in any case, the entire slope is characterized by long trenches, scarps, and counter scarps. This is interesting for this reason. I was mentioning to you before that uh, this rock slide is on the extreme side of this uh, um, deep-seated slope deformation, and uh, uh, the, the interesting fact is that uh, you have uh, many springs at the toe of the slope and here also on the, on the higher part of the slopes, but uh, the, the counter scarps and scarps are controlling the hydrologic network, so the superficial drainage, and not only the superficial drainage, but here we can see the superficial drainage. So most of the water uh, from the melting or from rainfall will try, in any case, uh, for the runoff, just to flow on the within the scarps, uh, within the trenches, and it will be redirected toward uh, the, the rock slide. Um, starting since 2005, um, the regional office started uh, doing investigation on the site, uh, at the beginning with a few boreholes um, that were mainly located in the upper part of the uh, landslide. And then uh, since 2005 up to now, practically, we, we have many different bowls and uh, a monitoring, a complete monitoring network that has been installed. Uh, up to now there are almost 22 boroughs and uh, vertical boroughs and 14 inclined boroughs. Uh, from geophysical investigation, uh, a failure surface uh, was uh, reconstructed and uh, um, this could be clearly correlated with uh, uh, monitoring data. We will talk about this a little bit later on. Um, for what concerns the monitoring network, uh, the monitoring network started uh, in 2002 with simple uh, di electrical distance meter uh, measurements and uh, from two station points and on eight targets. So we had only um, available uh, 15 measurements in this period, but uh, you see that uh, in this uh, uh, time interval, we had displacement uh, between a few tens of decimeters up to a couple of meters of displacement. And then and since 2009, uh, we started installing a ground-based insert, nine GPS uh, uh, points benchmark for uh, uh, periodic manual measurements, five continuous GPS, and one total station. So the system was quite redundant for what uh, concerned the uh, superficial displacement. And then we uh, started uh, installing uh, a geotechnical monitoring network consisting of inclinometer casings, uh, uh, piezometers, borehole wiring stesometer when uh, inclinometer casing were uh, cut through, um, open piezometers, and uh, uh, multiparametric uh, probes. Uh, what is interesting here is that uh, you will see, and you have already seen some of the data here, is that the displacement are quite conspicuous. So the, the operating life of the instrumentation, especially of deep, the seated, uh, deep uh, instrumentation, is quite short. So it can be just one season in some cases. Um, we used, again, the same kind of approach that we have seen before for Ruinon, and we 
um, were able to uh, zone the landslide in five main different uh, uh, areas with different behavior. And uh, the ground-based insert gave us also the possibility to um, redefine partially the limits uh, of, the, of the rock slide. That, that is not easy because uh, the, the toe of the rock slide is not really so apparent uh, when you are in the field. Just for a quick comparison, you have on the left-hand side uh, the um, uh, displacement during the month um, of April uh, 2011, and you have on the right uh, the, um, for the same month, April, but uh, for 2013. And you see that, uh, uh, for example, there is a big change in color. And if you see the difference between 2012 and 2013, you see that there is a sort of uh, progressive uh, uh, increase in the displacement rate and in the cumulative displacement within the landslide for each year. So that can be quite interesting for the um, future analysis uh, that we are going to look at. Um, how the landslide reacted, the, and it is also interesting, the landslide reacts quite well, quite instantaneously to the snow melting. And when the snow melting is handing, you still see that uh, there is uh, a relatively long period of uh, displacement um, with high displacement rates. And, uh, and then during the, uh, the dry season or the very cold season, you go through a very low displacement. So, and uh, just to, to show you also that one more point that we look at is that how through the year we had uh, uh, an increase in the sensitivity of the rock slide to uh, snow melting. For what concerns uh, deep uh, uh, displacement, so subsurface monitoring, uh, um, in clinometer casing they, 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 have, they had a very short uh, operating life and so uh, we decided to install uh, uh, biaxial uh, fixed in clinometer uh, columns. Uh, up to 120 meters long. So this is, you can see here the higher lifting of one of the columns. And here is the introduction of the column uh, within the borehole. And that, at least, uh, they have been able to uh, resist uh, to very large displacement, especially with respect to other systems. Here is just a, a, um, a window from the um, program to that manage the data from the uh, multiparametric probes. And uh, in particular here, there are uh, data for uh, the last year. So between uh, 2000, April uh, 2013 and uh, uh, March 2014. And you see a maximum displacement of about one meter, 1,000 millimeter. And uh, you, you also recognize a clear seasonality. So you see that uh, here you have, a, uh, starting from March, April 2013, a, a very high uh, displacement rate uh, for uh, four months mainly. And then uh, the, the landslide is uh, slowing down and then now is uh, restarting again. What we can uh, uh, derive more from this data? Okay, we can derive the sensitivity of the landslide to the snow melting, how rapidly it respond to the snow melting. Usually we see that at the starting of the snow melting, uh, surficial displacement are start immediately and just after a very short period that can be a, a week to two weeks uh, of time the the landslide responds also at uh, higher uh, depth uh, the, the piezometric level instead is bouncing high only at the end of the um, of the snow melting season if we uh, now a very interesting point if we look at this very specific time interval in this case just a week in this series, what we see is that uh, each of these lines is representing the displacement of one probe, a single probe, one meter long, uh, placed at a, at a specific depth. So in the, what you see here is that, uh, just uh, let's try to look at this one that is m even more clear. Um, you have that uh, in less than one day, you have most of the displacement occurring at a, that specific uh, probe element. So. Um, in some cases, it's just time, a question of hours more than days uh, or weeks. So uh, the behavior is quite, the displacement is quite, it can be instantaneous at death, and uh, it can um, resemble something like a stick slip behavior, like for some faults, or a system that is uh, overpressurizing and depressurizing. So you have, a, for example, a buildup of uh, 
for pressure or of stresses, and then you have uh, the, a sudden uh, release uh, um, of all the stresses. Uh, you have displacement, and then you need more time to rebuild up the, the stresses. So uh, it's quite interesting because it, usually it's almost impossible to observe something like this uh, at depth. With all this data, we were able to reconstruct the failure surface position at different places uh, within the landslide and to define uh, the thickness of the uh, failure surface. You will see that this can be quite interesting and we will discuss that a little bit um, further. There is also another interesting um, element, for example, in this one that is placed, uh, the, this borehole is, is placed in the uh, rock slide head. And uh, you see that the shear zone, uh, or the active shear zone, is well above the, uh, the maximum depth of the, of the borehole, even if uh, at depth you still have uh, fractured uh, levels that are the black layers uh, in, the, in the stratigraphic column. Uh, okay, w what we can also say is that um, uh, having very detailed uh, information at depth, uh, we can uh, um, study the displacement rates at depth. Uh, usually we are worried about uh, very large displacement at the surface, like um, for many rock slides, and we will see that later on. Uh, the, the three shoulders for a possible collapse, uh, they are defined in around a few millimeters per hour. So what is interesting is the error that, for example, uh, at 88 meters of depth, we had uh, for a certain period of time up to 14 millimeters per day of displacement. So that is uh, a very large amount of displacement in a rock slide at uh, uh, almost 100 meters of depth. And this was going on for almost a month. And uh, what we see here is also the, um, the delay between the maximum, the, the, reach, the landslide reaching the maximum piezometric level and the landslide reaching the maximum displacement. Uh, rate. If we want to understand more about the rock slide and how they behave, what we need is uh, uh, an understanding of the groundwater flow regime within the landslide. So uh, what is interesting here is that the rock slide can be seen as a beginning as a uh, rigid uh, brick just laying on the, on the plane. And uh, this block, uh, this rigid block, can undergo some fracturing. And if it starts fracturing, the, the hydraulic conductivity will uh, increase. And um, if this block will start moving on a failure surface, the failure surface will start cracking, opening, fracturing. And so the, uh, the hydraulic conductivity will increase uh, along that layer. But if we increase the displacement at that point, uh, the fracturing will go on and on, and we will have a finer material on the bottom. And so we'll, we will start reversing the system. So we will have a much less permeable material below a very permeable uh, layer. So that is interesting because it's showing that uh, through the year, of also for very long uh, living landslide, we can have very high very large changes in behavior through time so and uh, a very um, different sensitivity to the to the, uh, the same type of perturbation so same amount of rain same amount of snow melt but a completely different type of response by the landslide so what uh, we have done was to study the um, uh, hydrogeological setting of the area that was done by uh, through the um, indirect investigation like uh, electrical tomography or uh, tracer testing. Uh, here is a tracer testing run uh, bringing water by helicopter. Uh, a costly experiment, but uh, it worked well. Uh, or directly at that through boreholes. And uh, we, were also, we had also data through uh, sub-horizontal drains. What uh, resulted was effectively uh, the tracer test, for example, were showing a, a control of the um, trenches uh, in the distribution of the w underground waters and uh, a, a sort of capturing effect uh, by the landslide. So the, the landslide is much more permeable and when uh, it gets water from a trench, uh, it will drive the, the, the water down toward the valley. So this is a, a simplified scheme of the landslide. The, the rock slide, actually the, the most active part uh, of the slope, a, a, we can call a paleo landslide or uh, a deep seated uh, gravitational slope deformation. And uh, so we will have a highly broken material here, a possibly uh, changing properties uh, 
in the, uh, at the first failure surface, the deep seated slope, the formation rock mass, and the, the bo very bottom, the very lower uh, failure surface. The, the channel uh, points here, they show the elevation of the springs on the sides of the uh, landslide. So you have more or less an idea of which could be the level of the uh, water, of the groundwater level within uh, the main trenches uh, along the slope. So what we have done at this point was to build up a, a groundwater model. In this case, it's a 2D, but also here you see this one was a 3D uh, model. And uh, we considered the effect of different um, uh, superposed uh, elements like uh, different shear bands with different uh, hydraulic conductivity or rock masses with different hydraulic conductivity. And then we were able more or less to reconstruct uh, the, or to, sim to simulate the um, uh, accurately enough the real uh, changes in the piezometric level that we have observed in the upper right corner. The two figures here are for two different seasons. So the season when you have a maximum uh, uh, um, uh, snow melting and at uh, the beginning uh, of the snow melt season. Uh, why we need uh, this data also to run some modeling. So if we want to run some stress strain models, we need also to introduce the uh, groundwater table and the changes in the piezometric level. Uh, so we built up uh, a numerical model, a finite element model. And uh, here you see uh, these are the, uh, is the are the intersection of the groundwater table with the failure surface. Um, it, it, it can be tricky to run uh, the uh, slope stability or the, the stress strain simulation in this case because we are uh, simulating a slope that is already moving, so we are already in an unstable condition. So what we wanted to simulate here was uh, to see if the failure surface that we um, back calculated that we derived from uh, our data was uh, uh, really the most uh, uh, realistic one for the phenomenon and if the displacement the distribution was similar to the displacement distribution that for example we are monitoring at the surface and that was uh, quite reasonable and we use also uh, 3D FEM simulation to simulate the um, possible uh, the the size of the um, areas that could be uh, destabilized by uh, scenarios of different size. For example, we can think that it is usually from our data set is the most uh, unstable area. If we uh, assume that these areas is falling, so this one could be the area that become unstable or more unstable. If uh, this area is released also from the slope, we will have, the, for example, that all this sector will start accelerating. So this is a way just to uh, build up some uh, um, volume estimates for possible uh, simulation of, for example, of the runout. Um, we have, what we have said is that uh, these lines are still moving and uh, it would be nice to have some model that is able to simulate what is occurring or what could occur under specific uh, uh, scenarios. Uh, for example, for much higher mm, no melting uh, discharges or for uh, exceptional rainfall or whatever. So the idea here was to use a one-dimensional viscoplastic model. And in particular, uh, the assumption uh, starts from the observation that uh, during this, the winter season, we have uh, continuous displacement. So the, the landslide doesn't stop, but continuous movement, the, the movement continues, even if the groundwater is very low within the, the slope. Uh, the idea was to simulate the, the rock slide as a block, as a rigid block, laying on a, a thin shear zone. So here uh, it's important because all the data that we have collected are getting inside the model. So we had the um, inclinometric or the DMS column data and so we were able at that point to say how deep uh, was the failure surface. Uh, having multiple data we were able to reconstruct the geometry of the failure surface so we can say how is important the uh, the slope angle uh, for the failure surface and from the data we are able also to say how thick uh, is the shear zone uh, below the landslide. 
Uh, there are some more assumptions, so the prevalent uh, translational displacement and the material close to a, a residual or critical state. So that means that uh, the, the friction angle, for example, is not changing or could not change too much unless uh, some specific uh, condition are occurring. Uh, the, the, the solution is quite similar to the classical uh, uh, block Newmark type uh, solution. Uh, the only uh, fact that we are introducing is a visto viscoplastic model of the Pergina type. So we have um, a relationship here that is explaining our model. We have a constitutive parameter that we have to back calibrate in some way. Uh, we have a viscous nucleus that we can choose uh, uh, in according different types of viscous nucleus like uh, a linear or a bilinear or an exponential one, we will see more later. And we have the plastic potential and the effective stresses. We can include and we include the weight, the seepage forces, uh, the hydrostatic force and the presence of pushing action between uh, elements. Um, this is our landslide. So the, our rock slide uh, has been uh, subdivided in, uh, according to different uh, um, approaches. So one is just to consider uh, the, the entire rock slide as a single block laying on a particular um, failure surface at a specific inclination. The other one so, is to consider the rock slide subdivided in different blocks with different characteristics. So each block will have a different angle of the failure surface, a different thickness and a different groundwater table. Um, and you see here for th this case we will have only one groundwater table geometry. And we can, from this one, uh, just by a, GIS, a simple GIS analysis, we can compute the average thickness of the groundwater table above the uh, failure surface. And this can be done for each different sector that we are um, recognizing in the area. So if we take the, the single block case, what we observe is that our model is doing this. And uh, you will ask why. So that, that is quite easy. Simply, this is the piezometric oscillation, but the piezometric oscillation is uh, never reaching the average uh, value of the average depth value of the failure surface. So uh, in reality, our um, landslide, in this case, our block is always dry and is just creeping at constant velocity. So it doesn't feel any perturbation. But instead, if we cut through in different blocks, uh, we, we are still, we are seeing that uh, the groundwater becomes important because the groundwater depth above the failure surface is getting relevant. And so the, each single block is start moving at different speed. And so and, uh, you see here the, the um, monitored data that are the dashed line and the continuous line that are the um, results of uh, our model. What is interesting here is that we calibrated the model only uh, in the initial period of the monitoring between 2009 and 2011, and then we went in prediction between 2011 and 2013. So it seems that the model is quite well performing. We were also considering the interaction between the different blocks, uh, and uh, uh, here it was done in a relatively simple way just by considering uh, um, the active and passive pressure and uh, the shear resistance between blocks moving uh, laterally to each other at the different uh, velocities. Okay, we have said that um, uh, we are monitoring in this case the displacement rates uh, for uh, rocks like that are not moving, they are moving fast but not really collapsing. But it would be interesting to understand what is going to happen if something is uh, collapsing. And uh, the other thing that would be interesting is to see if some constraints are changing. Uh, for example, it could be the thickness of the shear zone or the properties along the shear zone. Uh, for example, if there is, um, we can just think at roughness. Uh, if we increase the displacement, the roughness along the shear zone uh, will decrease, we get smoother or uh, by greening the material, we will get from a coarse material to a much uh, uh, finer material. Or again, when the rock slide can start moving faster, we will have a, a possible dependence of the properties from uh, the rate of displacement. So the, um, all these points can become interesting. So we, we, we can arrive so uh, the, at one of the last uh, uh, example is the, the Vaillant landslide. So the, we had, uh, 50 years ago, more or less, in 1963, we had 
a major rock slide failure along the uh, flanks of a, a hydroelectric reservoir. And uh, since then, uh, people started, uh, for example, reconstructing the geometry of the failure surface. And we see through the years that uh, different authors with the same, starting from the same data set, from more or less the same geological information and the same uh, deep uh, uh, data set, that the, the, the final failure surface, they, they were completely different. And if we consider something like this with uh, most of the resisting block on a, lying on a, on a flat surface or something like uh, laying on a, on a much steeper, we can say, because uh, at this point uh, every, every degree of inclination can become important. So the behavior of the lens like, can be completely different and you will need completely different assumption or uh, physical mechanical property to explain the stability and the instability of the lens light. And uh, another interesting point, if we take the Rossi and Semenza map, uh, that uh, they, they, they prepared both a pre-failure and a post-failure geological map. And uh, if we look at the pre-failure and the distribution of the failure, they observe uh, an initial instability at the beginning of the, 19, of the year 1960 in the very lower part of the slope. And moving through the, the 60, 61, 62, and 63, the failure progressed more or less uh, progressively through uh, the landslide mass uphill, moving uphill. And uh, in 1960, in November, between October and November, we had also the uh, complete uh, M-shaped uh, uh, tension crack uh, um, developing in the upper part of the slope. And in 1963, finally, more or less, the, the final geometry was right there. So what we have done here was uh, uh, to try to derive some critical parameters for the uh, material located within the shear zone uh, or more or less around the shear zone of the uh, Vaillant rock slide and uh, we have done uh, some uh, finite element simu 3D finite simu uh, element simulation for the rock slide and uh, here you see the, the displacement distribution, the cumulative displacement distribution within the model at the lowering of the cohesion and uh, uh, friction angle. And you, wh what is interesting is that clearly for a fixed uh, reservoir level, in this case 700 meter, by decreasing you see the increase in activity of the slope, especially in the lower part, and more or less as it has been described uh, during the events, you have a in progressive increase uh, of activity moving uphill within the landslide mass. And uh, another interesting point is that uh, in the shear zone here is quite small, it's quite thin, so it's difficult to see, but uh, uh, you see that the red zone uh, increased progressively uh, with the decreasing clearly of the uh, properties within the shear zone. And, uh, and that means that uh, the uh, plastic strain and the stressing along the surface is moving with time along the, or could, could have been moved within the, the shear zone in uh, the lens line. What is interesting of uh, Vaillant is that we have a complete record of displacement since more or less the, the initial movement or the initial destabilization of the system till more or less the final collapse. Uh, it is known, for example, that uh, um, uh, the, topography, uh, the topographers, they were working at the time of the landslide. So they, they were collecting data ju just during the, the event. So just because it was much easier to collect good data at that time of the day. And, uh, and so we, uh, we have a relatively good uh, data set. And what we have tried, well, the idea here was that why don't we take the same example that we have, the same model that we have used before for La Sachs, and why don't we try to apply that to a completely different condition like the one in, uh, um, in Vaillant. So what we need here was uh, something that uh, was uh, uh, giving a, a softening to the model or simply the, the possibility to introduce in the model a, a rate and state dependent uh, um, strength. So that, is, uh, that there are different uh, laws that have been proposed and uh, one of the most famous is the ba or all of them are mainly based on the Dietrich-Ruina law and uh, that 
it works for tribometry, it works, uh, it has been applied to earthquakes and faulting and uh, also the, to some landslide. So the idea is that uh, you have a coefficient of friction mm -hmm. that is a function of the velocity of the rate of displacement and this uh, is uh, controlled by a static value of this coefficient, a minimum value of the coefficient and a velocity, a threshold velocity to start uh, the, the weakening. And this velocity is a function of the characteristic of the material and that can include also the, uh, the thermal capacity and the weakening temperature and the physical characteristic of the, uh, of the material itself. Um, why this is interesting? Because for example some authors like uh, Ferri di Toro uh, they run, um, together with other authors, uh, um, high-speed tests uh, on the material located along the shear zone uh, or on the clays uh, located on the shear zone uh, of the Vaillant uh, ferro surface. So this is uh, the same result uh, that we have seen before for the Lasax, but this is for the Vaillant shown with the effect of the weakening or softening or flesh weakening that we can introduce with the relationship. So you see, without flesh weakening or without uh, 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 relaxation of the strength parameter, we, we don't get any uh, rapid collapse, but uh, as soon as we start with the weakening, uh, we have a very uh, unstable system. And uh, in this case, you see that the friction angle is simply decreased by from 12.7. The minimum value that we were imposing was uh, uh, about uh, 10 degrees, and what we observe is that uh, for a, a decreased down to 10.5 degrees, we have a very strong increase uh, in uh, velocity. Okay, so the, uh, w when you have a, a lens like mass like 300 million cubic meter that is moving, you could observe a, a propagation of the system. That, that was uh, interesting because it was simply a, a simulation of the propagation for the Lasax uh, uh, rock slide. Okay, so we can have uh, a rock slide that this one is start moving faster and faster and then we can have that the, the material get free in some way so it uh, overpass the geometric uh, constraint and uh, it start flowing on the slope. So at this point if the toe is quite high on the slope you will have a lot of energy to release and you can start having movement and erosion uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the slope and finally you could have a final deposition occurring in a flat area or you can still arrive in against another di different material that can be quite uh, responsive like a water reservoir. So we took again the, the case of the Vaillant uh, rock slide. Well, this is interesting because uh, Vaillant rock slide is uh, uh, pushing some way against a, a reservoir that is uh, very uh, shallow with respect to the to the landslide, so that we have a slide through the number that is relatively low. So we have, what we have done was to um, we started that in uh, more or less in uh, 2000, because in 2001 we were working on the La Colinas uh, landslide in uh, um, Salvador, and we started developing this uh, code that was originally a um, classical finite element code for uh, geomechanical uh, simulation. And uh, Dennis Rodeman uh, developed a, a very large strain, very large deformation algorithm based uh, on a, an arbitrary Eulerian Lagrangian uh, uh, calculation scheme. And um, we were able to simulate at this point a very large deformation and uh, to simulate the, uh, the presence of uh, discontinuities or layers uh, on which uh, we co could concentrate the displacement and, uh, and we were able to run uh, the first set of uh, 2D simulation, for example, for the Vaillant. Here you see the, the sliding that is start moving, the, the Vaillant gorge that has been filled of the material and the propagation of a shear zone within uh, the deposits. Uh, the, the next step was, uh, okay, it's more a problem of uh, computational time, we run a dry or without lake, uh, a fully 3D uh, simulation of the spreading. And in this case, uh, the simulation is just represented in terms of changing thickness uh, uh, or changing in elevation of the model. So we have uh, uh, decrease in elevation, increase in elevation, deposition and uh, ablation of material. And uh, why not using putting water, okay, so we put water in the front and we run some 2D simulation. The problem in uh, 2D simulation is that uh, you have water that is simply uh, pushed 
up a hill uh, and uh, above the, the main landslide mass, that is what happened, uh, and it can be representative of a cross section just in the middle of the, in the center line of the main landslide, but uh, the very hand is, is not really able to simulate fully the, uh, the case study. So what we have considered here is that water was considered incompressible and fully inviscid, and this is important too. Okay, so la, mm, the landslide in this case is moving, uh, uh, pushing water in the front, but uh, what we want to see in this case is uh, the real effect of the 3D rock slide moving against the entire reservoir. And so it is uh, the simulation showing a f in a fully 3D mode. So you have the rock slide that is uh, fully 3D. So it's deforming a completely different depth, not only at the surface, so it is not a depth average model. And you see the, the water that is pushed in the front and is rising against the opposite slope. You see even a, a sort of a big it's a sort of backwashing, so the, the wave is crashing back and is collapsing on the door, and, uh, and part of the water is flowing uh, around the dam. So we, we are not simulating here the entire part of flow just when the water went above the, the, the dam, mainly because it's, it's a problem, it's a computational problem. So this one was done with about uh, almost one million of hexahedral elements, and, uh, and also the, in this case is a computational problem. So having a much more refined uh, um, thickness of the single element, so the, the, the simulation could have been even more precise. What is good is that we were able to compare the um, final uh, maximum rise of the water wave in front of the rock slide with the real uh, uh, track that was mapped by uh, the geologists just after the uh, rock slide. And so you see that uh, the, the blue line that is the maximum of observed uh, um, run up of the water it fits quite well with the channels color that is the, the, the model result for the maximum run up. And uh, the, the maximum velocity in this case uh, of the landslide reached uh, about 60 meters per second as a maximum velocity. That means really not really so much because you can look at the maximum velocity of the front or any part of the landslide. So that can be, uh, should be interpreted. Uh, the, the final uh, validation of the, the data set was done against the um, the available data. So we, are, we, we have here the streamline showing the, the movement of the particle during the simulation. Both of the water, for example, you see that the part of the water has been pushed uh, upstream, not only downstream. And we compare this with uh, uh, some uh, displacement vectors, just taking the um, homologous points between uh, the first geological map produced by Semenza and the uh, post landslide uh, geological map. So the red lines are connecting points that moved from the, the initial position to the final position and simply by, by comparing geological markers. And the, the fitting was quite bad. Uh, we say that the Vaillon case is a case with a relatively low fraud number because the landslide is quite thick and the water is quite shallow. But we, so we were interested at this point, what is, are we able to simulate something like a landslide that is sinking within a very deep uh, water reservoir, like in a fjord or uh, a sea, whatever. So they, we started doing some 2D simulation against um, uh, well-constrained uh, laboratory flume test or ta water tank test. And in particular, we ran this test uh, simulating uh, um, some uh, rigid landslide sinking in at high speed uh, within uh, a water tank. And these tests were performed uh, in um, Oslo and the Department of Mathematics, uh, of Applied Mathematics, to simulate the tsunami uh, generated by the Oknes rock slide in case of uh, uh, complete collapse. And so what we uh, were able to simulate was the um, formation of a backward uh, collapsing impact crater. You see that the water is uh, um, penetrated by the impacting uh, rigid uh, landslide. And then uh, you have a collapse uh, again on the, on the main landslide. At, the, at that point, you also observe the solitary wave that is propagating within the water tank. The same has been done with the deformable so that uh, 
usually no landslide is arriving as a rigid body against the reservoir, but uh, it will be a deformable mass. And that is quite interesting because the, ge the geometry of the front and the elongation of the body can uh, control the, the, the type of wave that is generated. So what we have done here, we have a fully deformable uh, mass that is sliding within the reservoir. We have the formation of a outward collapsing uh, um, wave or impact crater, and then we have the back washing uh, or washing back against uh, over the landslide mass. Uh, you observe here also something very peculiar that is part of the material is, uh, you, you observe a sort of a, a kind of plume of granular material that is detached from the landslide that it is dragged by the wave uh, upstream, so that it is flushing back. And then again, you have the solitary wave that is propagating within the tank. What we were able really to simulate, I don't have here the comparison with the experimental result, but the fitting was extremely good. And so that was uh, interesting. The final uh, uh, set of simulation that we've done was uh, we have a rock sled, it gets uh, uh, unstable, gets accelerating, and finally collapse. And it can collapse instead in, wo that in water and on uh, solid material. So for example, in an alluvial plain, and uh, um, what we, we were interested in understanding which kind of uh, effect has the um, type of material, the, for example, an alluvial mattress uh, at the bottom of the valley, which kind of effect can have on the propagation, if it can fa facilitate the propagation or if it can uh, uh, amper the, the propagation of the landslide. In this case, for example, if you pass from a, a frictional cohesive material to a purely cohesive material, you have a completely different kind of uh, um, deformation occurring within uh, the material itself. So you, is, you see here that uh, the material is a sort of uh, folded within uh, the, the plane, or in this case, uh, for a poorly cohesive material, you have a sort of truss-like material. So you have a big wedge that is pushed in a passive wave above the uh, resting material. Okay, just to conclude. Uh, I, I think that we, we saw a very uh, large set of application uh, of methods uh, to rock slide. I, I don't think that they are uh, in any case complete. So it is just what uh, we have done uh, uh, by ourselves uh, through the year. But we, what we saw is that uh, a geological model is fundamental and it's fundamental to understand what is controlling the rock slide and to get some data that can be fundamental for modeling. Uh, the rock mass characterization uh, at large scale uh, is quite important. Usually it's difficult to decide which kind of properties uh, these rock slides uh, can be assigned to so, um, uh, because they change with displacement. And so uh, it, is, it is not always easy or it is difficult to define a law of change of properties with time and displacement. Uh, and uh, as we have seen for most of the example, most of the displacement is occurring on a shell, uh, on a very thin layer. For example, the, for the Vaillant, uh, some of the literature, um, of the researchers, they say that the displacement was in, in few centimeters, probably is too much, but definitely it, can, it could have been in narrow, very narrow uh, shear bands. And, uh, and here the properties can change a lot and it can be difficult to characterize the material at that scale. And uh, uh, we need for uh, uh, a complete understanding of the landslide a, a long-term monitoring. Usually short-term monitoring is just giving us a, an idea about the state of activity and the eventual need for uh, the, the setting up of a more complex system or simply abandoning the system and say, okay, there is no problem, uh, no real hazard from this rock slide. But definitely if you want to understand more, you need a very a sophisticated system that is giving you uh, information both at the surface and at depth, and uh, it can resolve most of the problem concerning uh, very slow displacement, for example, during uh, um, uh, cold or dry season and showing the response at uh, uh, the change of small, even small changes of the perturbing factors. Uh, so the forcing factors are quite important. Uh, with a very good detailed monitoring, we, we have a very good and detailed model of the landslide. So we have a good description of the volume, of the size, and ge geometry. Uh, 
this, the geometry of the failure surface, for example, for who is working on runout, is uh, controlling the initial part of the movement, and so it can redirect uh, the landslide in different directions. So that uh, can be important also for hazard and risk zonation uh, just below the lens, this landslide. We have also seen that uh, with the relatively simple one-dimensional model, it's possible to catch the, mm, the behavior of this rock slide, even in a simplified way. And, uh, and probably it, there is no need to push that too much. So we, we are still working on that. But uh, if you go probably too much into detail, you will need some numerical model that is giving you probably better the result. And finally, that rocks that very often are associated to cascade-like events, so that they can be associated to not only to the rock sliding, but to a flow, and then uh, to the impact on a reservoir or uh, any kind of artificial or natural, like in fjordlands. And, uh, and from that moment on, you can start with a, a really enormous uh, type of consequence. Uh, as I said before, uh, this work is the result of uh, many collaboration uh, with uh, both my people at my department uh, and colleagues that are working uh, with myself and um, people from other university and uh, people from uh, small companies that help out in numerical modeling and all the um, national and local institutions that gave us access to uh, most of the data and paid for most of the investigation. Uh, finally, uh, just because uh, I made some references in the, in the test of the, of the presentation, uh, I put some references at least at the, at the end of the presentation so that you can go through and if you're interested, uh, take advantage. Thank you so much. <laughs>